Africa. Welcome to Daybreak Africa from the Voice of America. I am James Barty in Washington. Today is Tuesday, January 31st, and here are some of the stories we are covering. Pope Francis begins his two-country visit to Africa in the Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, Kinshasa, today, Tuesday. I may tell you, Kinshasa has a new image, a new look. It's been cleaned up, uh, roads, repairs, uh, street lights back to work actually. Uh, it's the northern city that is going to uh, welcome the Pope in a few hours. Some 22 million people are said to be at risk of hunger as the worst drought in 40 years hits the Horn of Africa. A corruption perception index is expected to be launched today in Nigeria's capital. Pro-democracy groups in Eswatini call for an international commission of inquiry into the killing of prominent human rights lawyer Tulani Maseko. Liberian President George Weir asked for another six years in office. It meant there for continuity and stability. It meant there for transformation. It meant there for development and growth. And we will speak with an expert on what is driving China's interest in Africa. Those stories and more are coming up on Daybreak Africa. Francis begins his two-country Africa visit today, Tuesday, in the Democratic Republic of Congo's capital, Kinshasa. The Pope is expected to meet with several survivors of conflict in the eastern part of the country. The meeting will be part of a five-day tour of the DRC and South Sudan, two countries experiencing years of violence and instability. Abraham Lua Kabuanka is the spokesperson for DRC President Felix Chisekedi. He tells me that the capital, Kinshasa, is being cleaned up and ready to welcome the pontiff. According to the preparedness, actually everything is, uh, is set up for the arrival of the Pope. The only thing that happened Monday was uh, an issue uh, due to the storm damaging one of the structures installed in the stadium for the meeting between the Pope and uh, the youth that is scheduled on Thursday. This damage was repaired this uh, morning. It took a few hours. Everything is set up and uh, the stands are ready to uh, welcome the Pope. So I may tell you, the Kinshasa has a new image, a new look. It's been cleaned up, uh, roads, repairs, uh, street lights, back to work, actually. Uh, it's another, another city that is going to uh, welcome the Pope in a few hours. Now, Abraham, your country, DRC, has the highest number of uh, Catholics in Africa. Now, what are your expectations or your government's expectations as the Pope comes to your country today? We are expecting a real communion between the Pope and the Catholic community. Also, it will be uh, an opportunity for him to see how Congolese people are struggling to see and to talk with uh, the civil society, talk with uh, politicians and, uh, you know, touch ground and uh, get the real situation of the country in this year that is leading us uh, through the elections by the end of the year. With the crisis in the east of your country, everyone is expecting that perhaps the Pope's visit might urge you in some kind of peace. Is the Pope expected to visit Eastern Congo? The program of the Pope during his stay in DRC is uh, organized for a long stay in Kinshasa capital. Uh, you may understand that due to uh, security measures, nobody wants him to be uh, maybe affected if he has to go uh, on the east side of the Congo where Actually, the Rwanda's army behind the M23s keep on, you know, attacking our position. So it will remain in Kinshasa from Tuesday, leaving by Friday. But this, for sure, representatives of the Catholic Church, I may tell you, from every part of the Congo, will be in Kinshasa and they will have opportunity to talk with the Pope about the situation that is... Uh, He's been seen on the ground, so he's going to be remaining in Kinshasa, and uh, we are hoping that everything will go smooth by God's grace, and uh, it will be a nice occasion also for the rest of the world to figure out where is the Congo, 
who are the Congolese people and how Congolese people do pray the Lord through our songs and, uh, and requests. Abraham Luakabuanga is the spokesperson for DRC President Felix Chisekedi. You are speaking with us from the capital, Kinshasa. Liberian President George Weah is asking voters to give him another six years mandate as head of the country. In his annual address to the country on Monday, President Weah outlined progress he has made and says there is still work to be done. But his opponents say the president has ignored what they call the bread and butter issues confronting Liberians. Moses Gaziawu reports from Monrovia. We have brought inflation down from a high of 30% to a single DJ rate that is now... President George Weir outlining how he has kept the country's economy from sinking by stabilizing prices and reducing inflation. He told the legislature that Liberia is now a macroeconomic exemption to declining economies in West Africa based on the progress his administration has made in boosting growth. The address was Weir's last for this term in office. He used it to remind voters that through his effort, the legislature enacted over 200 bills that ranged from property and human rights to the protection of free speech. For the enactment into law of the Kamara Abdullah Kamara Act of Press Freedom, which is a very historic piece of legislation and criminal lies free speech as a strong in our 1986 constitution. But the highlight of the gathering was when we are asked Liberians to give him another term in office. I will be coming to you shortly. It meant to continue on the homework. We have never. It meant for continuity and stability. It meant for transformation. It meant for development and growth. Liberians go to the polls to choose a new president in October in elections expected to be managed for the first time independently by Liberians since the end of the Civil War. The country National Elections Commission will have to run the elections in the absence of the United Nations mission in Liberia that has since pulled out. But the president has said the country is ready for the tax. Continue to demonstrate to the world that we are a peace-loving nation and that we are capable and ready to undertake elections that include all Liberians in a free and credible process. We are asked for collaboration in dealing with who be troublemakers who will want to jeopardize the peace Liberians enjoy currently. He also lauded the United States and President Joe Biden for standing by Liberia in promoting democracy in the country. We are disclosed that Washington has pledged about 20 million United States dollars to the electoral process and is optimistic that the United States will continue to remain Liberia's primary diplomatic ally. America is our traditional partner. So, a friend of America is our friend. But if you're not a friend of America, then you're not our friend. Meanwhile, the me opposition United Party says the president failed to address the real issues facing Liberians. The UP chairman, Luther Tapi, said we have shown again that he lacks the will power to lead the Liberian people. The State of the Nation address today confirms once again what we have always said, that more people are in urgent poverty today than six years ago. The president has always failed to address the bread and butter issue affecting the Liberian people. This address on Monday was Weah's last in the current term as president until elections are held in October. But some observers say the former football star faces an uphill battle as his political rallies have drawn fewer people than his last election in 2017. For VOA News, I'm Moses Gazo in Monrovia. In Nigeria, the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center, the local chapter of Transparency International, plans to launch the Corruption Perception Index 2022 in the capital Abuja today, Tuesday. The index, which was developed by the International Anti-Graft Organization in 1995, is an annual ranking of nations according to levels of corruption within each country. The launch comes as Nigerians head to the polls in general elections on February 25. For more on the launch of the Corruption Perception Index, viewers Peter Clotty reached Aua Musa, Executive Director of the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center. We are hoping that uh, the Nigerian authority will take note of some of these uh, very important you know, um, issues around corruption in Nigeria and the need to take proactive measures to deal with the corruption issues 
Uh, well, how uh, significant a report is this? And will there be recommendations as to how the officials in government can use this to improve the way things are done in Nigeria? It is very important and significant uh, in the sense that um, it highlighted areas for uh, concern and areas where government needs to take proactive measures to improve, to ensure that um, uh, corruption is minimized in public sector. It is uh, very important to ensure that um, both the outgoing and the incoming into this key important and then be able to uh, plan and be able to mitigate how to reduce the cost of corruption that has uh, made Nigerians very, very, very vulnerable in terms of the security and safety of Nigerians. And equally, uh, in the area of uh, collapse of infrastructure, collapse of education, collapse of um, uh, healthcare system, and quite a number of things. So it is important that government listen to this issue very well with view to address our socio-economic and political, uh, you know, crisis. Otherwise, if government, you know, continue to ignore and distance except from what Nigerians are feeling, are going through, it will be big betrayal for Nigerian people. Has there been any political will and the commitment in the fight against corruption? So precisely, this is part of the challenges that we are facing. While the institutions, you know, um, are doing their technical work in terms of carrying out their mandate, then the political head always uh, water down or undermine or delay or frustrate those um, issues. For example, uh, a lot of money and resources have been spent to investigate and subsequently try some people who have uh, been caught uh, looting the national resources. But because of political consideration, those people were pardoned. Awa Musa is the executive director of the Civil Society Legislative Advocacy Center. He was speaking with viewers Peter Clotty. You are listening to Daybreak Africa on the Voice of America. I'm James Barton, Washington. Today is Tuesday, January 31st. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Some 22 million people are at risk of hunger as the worst drought in 40 years hits the Horn of Africa. The United Nations says 12 million people in Ethiopia, 5.6 million in Somalia, and 4.3 million in Kenya are acutely food insecure after living through the fifth straight poor rainy season. Victor Chinyama is Chief of Communications and Partnerships for UNICEF in Somalia. He tells viewers Caravan Dam that most people in the country have lost their livelihood because they depend on livestock to eke out a living. I have met many families that have told me that they have lost their entire herd uh, of livestock. And this has forced um, about a million people plus to leave their homes, to move towards the urban centers in search of help. It also means that we are seeing a spike in diseases such as cholera and measles. And when you have cholera, you have measles, that combined with malnutrition, we can very quickly see uh, the rate of mortality, especially among children, escalate. How many people are affected by the drought in this area that we're talking about? Well, the estimations last year were that about 7.8 million Somalis were affected by um, food insecurity, and that's about half the entire population of Somalia. This year, um, we estimate that that number will go up by half a million. So we'll be looking at about 8.2, 8.3 million people needing humanitarian assistance. And when you include the parts of Ethiopia and the parts of Kenya, the UN is saying it's it's about 12 million people. Then, of course, we have larger numbers. In fact, we will have uh, about 20 million people that will need uh, assistance in all the three countries that you mentioned there. But I should also add that a catastrophe of this nature inevitably will affect children, mostly uh, children aged below five years of age. And we have seen that uh, here in Somalia, about 1.8 million children are suffering from severe malnutrition, 
and about half a million of those will require treatment. If treatment does not reach these children in a timely manner, then chances are high that they will not survive. How many people in your area, in Somalia, are herders? And this dramatically affects them. Do do they have to just up and leave their homes? Absolutely. It affects most Somalis, as you know, uh, uh, dependent on livestock, their pastoralists. And they're pastoralists who depend on water. They depend on pasture. And when you have um, droughts such as we have uh, coming not just once, but coming so often nowadays, then that directly affects their means of livelihood. They lose their livestock. They lose a a rich source of protein and nutrition, the milk that children need in order to keep up their uh, their nutritional status. So it does affect a large, large uh, proportion of the population in Somalia, but also they are agro-pastoralists. These are people who combine both the keeping of livestock as well as some form of agriculture. And I have met many, many families who have told me they have not been able to plant anything for uh, the last two years because there's simply been no rain whatsoever. That was Victor Chinyama, Chief Communications Advocacy and Partnership for UNICEF in Somalia. You are speaking to my colleague, Carol Van Dam from Ogadishu. In Eswatini, the Multi-Stakeholders Forum is calling for an international commission of inquiry into the killing a week ago of its leader, Tulani Maseko, who was laid to rest on Sunday. An Eswatini government spokesperson told VOA a week ago that the government had launched an investigation into what he called the ruthless killing of innocent civilians. The call for an international investigation comes as the Southern African Development Community Organ on Politics, Defense and Security is meeting today, Tuesday, in Namibia. Sikilela Dramini is the Secretary General of the Multi Stakeholders Forum, a broad coalition of opposition groups. He tells me the group wants a commission of inquiry led either by the United Nations, African Union, or any trustworthy international body because the group does not trust the Eswatini government. There is nothing that has come out of that investigation. In fact, It's a problem because investigations are always conducted by government in such matters, but the outcome of the investigation remains unknown. That is why we believe engaging an independent investigation team, probably one that is not found in source and coming from other countries, uh, if it were to be supported by regional and continental or even global bodies like UN, like um, SADC, like um, African Union, a body that is going to be independent of government, we would appreciate that. And so our demand is that the investigations must be conducted by an independent body. King Mswati III has reportedly been quoted saying that uh, Maseko was killed as a result of infighting within the mass democratic movement. Is there any infighting within your pro-democracy movement? No. Maseko was one of those people who was a unifier, uh, who believed in dialogue and the peaceful resolution of differences of whatever kind. And his name was prominent among the mass democratic movement and it was very accommodative. And the many people from the mass democratic movement they revered and respected him. And it is highly unlikely, therefore, that his death could be as a result of anything that may be attributed to infighting within the mass democratic movement. We understand uh, there is a SADC meeting this week. And uh, what would you expect to come out of the meeting? Yes, it is true that there is a SADC meeting that is underway. It started today with the technical committees, and tomorrow, that is the 31st of January, it will be the meeting for the heads of state. As civil society, we are not accredited to attend since we are not invited. But what we did is that we did write to the executive secretary of SADAC last week Wednesday, notifying him about what had befallen us as the MDM and further placing some demands in terms of how we think the country should be channeled or 
driven going forward in terms of how we are going to maneuver through the obtaining political situation. Now, what you can say is that we, however, expect that this is a meeting on the Troika organ on defense and security. Troika deals with security and political issues within member states. So we expect ourselves to be at the top of the agenda. Sikelela Dramini is the Secretary General of the Multi Stakeholders Forum of Eswatini, formerly Swaziland. He was speaking with me from the capital, Mbabani. China has a long history of economic and political ties with Africa. It is one of the continent's largest trade partners, providing over $140 billion in loans to finance infrastructure projects, including roads and railways. However, critics say the country is practicing debt trap diplomacy by lending to African nations that it knows cannot repay the loans. For what is driving China's interest on the continent, viewers Jackson Vunganyi spoke to Jai Long Wan, a Global China Pre-Doctoral Research Fellow at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center. She leads research for the Chinese Loans to Africa database for the 2021-2023 research cycles. Let's start off with the numbers. Right? So between 2000 and 2020, so Chinese Loans to Africa database that we manage at Boston University estimates that Chinese financiers together signed 1,188 loan commitments, together worth $160 billion of loans to 49 African governments, state owned enterprises, and regional multilateral organizations. So think Africa, so think um, the Africa Export Import Bank. So $160 billion, this is a tremendous amount of financial injection. And it's a very rapid growth from the early 2000s when comparatively there was just a trickle. And let's put this into perspective. So during the same period, so from 2000 to 2021, the OECD DAC, that's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Development Assistant Desk, long name, OECD DAC. This is made up of 30 mostly Western high-income economies, but also includes Japan and South Korea. So OECD DAC during the same period contributed about $730 billion worth of uh, official development assistance and uh, other official flows to Africa. So comparatively, China alone, just in loans, right, contributed, this is about 22% of what OECD DAC does. And this doesn't include uh, China's grants or China's um, in-kind donation and things mm. like that. Or oh, the well. foreign assistance, the foreign aid. Exactly. So this is just loans, and that's 22% of what OECD DAC is doing. So it does look like, um, considering the amount, it does look like Africa is of great importance to China's plans abroad. So what is in it for China to continue pouring so much money into Africa? So to understand this, we have to look into the years leading up to this surge, right? So the rise of Chinese loans to Africa coincided with China's going out policy, in the late 1990s, right? This is a policy that supports Chinese domestic companies in gaining overseas market shares, right? This is to support Chinese companies going out. No bigger market than Africa at the time, which was growing, still growing. It's a a market of great potential, right? So there are two factors that influence this going out policy, particularly particularly with respect to construction sector, which accounts for the bulk of Chinese loans in Africa. The railways, the roads. Exactly. Mm. So what are these two major factors? First, it is the anticipated overcapacity of construction contracts in China. China. Okay. Okay. And the second is the anticipated competition from foreign construction companies once China joins WTO in 2001. Jilong Wang, a Global China Pre-Doctoral Research Fellow at Boston University Global Development Policy Center. She spoke with viewers Jackson Vungani. And that's it for this Tuesday, January 31st edition of Daybreak Africa. We thank you for spending your morning with us. For more African news and features, visit our website at voaafrica.com. Connect with us on all social media platforms. We are on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are also on YouTube, where you can watch our TV shows, Africa 54, Straight Talk Africa, and Red Carpet. On behalf of the Daybreak Africa team, I am James Barty in Washington, wishing you will have an amazing Tuesday.